Welcome to There to Hear, an educational podcast where industry professionals talk nuts and bolts about how they got from there to here. On today's show, Ralph Winter talks about his experience with high budget films and how it compares to his current involvement with low budget films, what defines their success, and how, in the face of a massively changing environment, the basics stay the same. As this is a new podcast, we're really wanting feedback, so go to media.colabinc.org, fill out the feedback survey, and you'll be entered to win a $25 Amazon gift card. From Colab Inc., I'm Tanya. Musgrave, and today I have Ralph Winter, a producer whose work includes the classic 80s Star Trek series, X Men, and Fantastic Four. Welcome to the show. Great, thank you. <laughs> that's quite thank the you. that's quite the journey, huh? It's uh, I've been very fortunate to work on a lot of interesting projects, and uh, yeah, I feel very you know privileged. Yeah. Uh, you know, been it wasn't necessarily my design. I didn't I. I'm a graduate from UC Berkeley in history, so I've never <laughs> intended to be in the uh, motion picture television business. Well, that sounds like a very interesting starting point. How did you get from there to here? Yeah, I uh, graduated in, at, from UC Berkeley in history and got a job uh, while my wife uh, was going to nursing school so we could support the family. And then when she graduated, I might go on to graduate school to do something else. But the job I got was at Broadway department stores in the training department, making videos. I'd had some experience growing up in high school and college doing some stuff and um, kind of stuck. It was fun. It was really fun. And uh, I made about 50 short industrial videos, all for employees, how to train employees, how to take inventory, how to ring the register, how to greet customers. And it was all, you know, for a business purpose and, I got some attention doing that. Some of them were fun. Some of them got me in trouble. And um, I enjoyed myself. And I realized that retailing, there was no future in doing video. So uh, one of my connections there referred me to Paramount Pictures where they were looking for someone. And I came in and I memorized the Eastman Kodak chart for film stock and I got the job. <laughs> and uh, so I worked in post-production at Paramount and really right time, right place. Mm. There, there were 10, 12 TV series on the air that were being produced at Paramount. There were only three networks then. Mm. And Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley, Mork and Mindy, all these big series that I met all the creatives and helped these people out. And then more opportunities came. And uh, one of those was with a producer. And I went out to work on Star Trek Three. I had helped them make Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Mm. So then it just kept kept going from there. I just, you know, kind of leverage one thing to the next. And there you go. Mm -hmm. One thing that I am really interested in, you know, in addition to all of these big series, what I see on your uh, on your IMDb in your your roster is a lot of the low budget films. There are multiple levels of your work. So it's not just these big studio films. It's also, you're also involved with micro budget films too. And that is generally where our audience is sitting right now. Right. It is the people who are, you know, they're, they're not in the union yet. They are working on these types of films where they're mid-level, you know, that kind of thing. So I would love to get the perspective of somebody who has worked on both uh, what that perspective is like, and if there is any crossover between uh, the skills that you use on a big studio side, you know, where where somebody who's mid-level can get to that and whether or not they even should want to? I was, I was working on huge movies for studios, and I didn't want to be pigeonholed into someone who is only working on $100 million movies and up. So I set out to work on specifically you know, smaller movie. So I made a movie for $500,000 with Bill Shatner, uh, a new director. I put it in theaters. I put it in something called Blockbuster that used to be a video store. <laughs> uh, and, you know, went through the process of uh, raising the money and uh, helping a young filmmaker get a story told. And, and I enjoyed the process. Uh, the movie is called Shoot or Be Shot. It's not really worth viewing, but fun with Bill Shatner and we had a great time doing it. And we shot for like 18 days in Los Angeles, non-union, mm. running around, borrowing equipment, doing all the things that you do when you start out. Mm. And the process is the same. And you still got to have a good story. You still got to mm. you know, manage a shooting day and you still have to put together a story that in the editing room that makes sense. 
you don't really have budget arguments at that price point because you know yeah. you can't argue about a crane. You don't have money for a crane. Yeah. So it's not about what kind of crane or equipment. I mean, it was because mm -hmm. a, a new filmmaker, I was able to get a Panavision camera for free and I had to scrounge around for film and lower budget movies generally it used to be that you had to worry about food and film. You got to pay the crew a little mm -hmm. bit, but you got to feed them. Mm -hmm. You got to have film for the camera. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, and then I embarked on some other lower budget, $2 million. I made a deal at Fox to make movies for the Christian market that were in the $2 million range mm -hmm. to try to open up that market for So, Fox. like, three and and one, uh, like, an adaptation from Frank Peretti and yeah. Ted Decker and, yeah. you know, thought, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And trying to convert, you know, what every filmmaker tries is to try to convert book buyers into ticket buyers. <laughs> not easy. Not the same. That's why book. Not the same market. Yeah. Book re book readers say, oh, that's not as good as the book. And so mm -hmm. it's two different mediums and yeah. everyone's aware of that, but it's still a trick into making the book cinematic. You know, when we do uh, a mainstream film like The Giver, Philip Noyce, uh, a Lois Lowry book that's required reading in California for uh, middle school students. As a writer in a book, you can imagine what the future, this dystopian future looks like. You don't have to make choices. As mm -hmm. filmmakers, we have to make choices. So yeah. what does futuristic wardrobe look like? Yeah. Does it have buttons? Does it have zippers? Does it have <laughs> you know Velcro? All those choices have to be cinematically made. So when you're mm -hmm. turning a book into a... a, a piece of filmed uh, entertainment. You've got to make a lot of different sets of choices and not everyone, you know, excels at that. Mm -hmm. I think the, again, so the process is the same. I think, you know, I'm, I'm mounting another $500,000, we're guessing 500 in this sort of virus environment. Small movie, not many actors, try to contain it. Again, try to shoot in 18 to 20 days. Not much of that has changed. And really the questions that, that cross over from big and small is, you know, is an audience going to come? Mm -hmm. I think all stories are worthwhile. All stories are good, but there's a limited number of stories that an audience will pay for. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. That's what makes you a producer is to figure out what that commercial angle is. How are you going to tell the story? Can I really get an audience to pay for this? Because there's lots of things that we love and want to see and think, Oh, that'd be great. That'd make a great movie. Yeah. Well, you need to, a, a large number of your friends to pay $10 to make it a business. Otherwise it's just a very expensive hobby. Yeah. But that principle I think is, has to be guiding and has to be at the front. How do you define its success? Like whether or not, because there are some that say, well, did it work? Not that it was good. It worked because it sold. It was still a little bit awful, but it sold. I mean, so is it successful? You know, you have like the B level Hallmark movies, you know, that there's a huge market for it. But, you know, quality wise, you can't really rest on that. So how do you specifically define its success? Right. That, that, that's exactly right. You got to define success. So, you know, I think people that bring the 5,000 or plus movies to Sundance, it's about a platform. It's not about making money. It's about getting noticed. It's about demonstrating you have skill to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And so it depends on what you're making and what that purpose is and what success is and making the short films that I've made, it wasn't about making money. It was about demonstrating I can tell a story and not have to have a hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. Hallmark mm -hmm. probably defines their success by viewers. Um, yeah. They get an audience and that's how they make money. Mm -hmm. um, Netflix, you know, if their stock price goes up, then they've done well. They've, they've managed to, from a tiger story to <laughs> whatever they're making, if it gets yeah. attention and it gets press and it drives up the stock and it gets increased subscribers. That's how they measure their success by subscribers. If the studios measure by box office. Uh, so but for a small budget film, you got to decide what you're doing it for. So do you have investors yet to pay back? You know, mm -hmm. if you want to make it a business, you do. Yeah. So yeah. if you raised a half a million dollars on a, on a small uh, budgeted feature, then you better figure out how I'm going to get that money back for those investors. Mm -hmm. So, are there streaming options? Do I really want to try to manage marketing and going to a theater these days? Probably not. So you probably want to line up a buyer before you start shooting because that'll give your investors confidence. And your investors may demand that. They may demand that you need some kind of streaming distribution plan in place 
before. And that depends on who the talent is, who's directing, who, where's the script from, et cetera, et cetera. So mm-hmm. when you're starting out, you probably can't do much of those things. So you probably can't spend half a million dollars. Yeah. You might spend a hundred, you might spend 50, you might spend mm-hmm. zero. Yeah. And it depends if you want to make it a business. If you want to just make it a hobby and make movies, you can do it. You can borrow a camera, you can edit on a Mac, you can yeah. slap it together and show your friends. Cool. But if you're going to make it a business, you pretty much, if you want to do it a second time, you got to pay back those investors. You got to respect them. You got to respect yeah. the money. So, what if they don't have those particular connections with a distributor yet? No one does. <laughs> no <laughs> one has those connections. Come on, you got to develop that. You got to figure that out. You got to you got to figure it out just the way everybody breaks in. The there's people breaking in the business today. Everyone yeah. breaks in. Everyone gets in and figures it out. You got to figure it out. Yeah. You got to get on that path. You got to get on that journey. You got to apply yourself. How bad do you want it? So go to film festivals. How did they do it? What did they do at Sundance? What did they pay for it? Who, how did they find a distributor? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that the film festivals actually are one way to do it because there's all those distributors are there and looking for something that stands out. Yeah. So, you know, it depends on the material you choose. Is it commercial? Is it meaningful? Is it emotional? You know, I think if you're going to make a career of it and demonstrate that you're passionate and you're a writer, then you should write something that's going to change your life. Hmm. Why would you attempt anything less? Yeah, exactly. Why would you, why would you try to do something that wasn't as important or valuable as that? Well, you want to copy, you know, uh, hunger games or copy, you know, everybody's copying stuff. What's original that you have? What's your voice? What do you have that you think the world needs to hear? And you can deliver that in a unique way. That's what you should do. So, from a producerial side of things, what elements other than story, other than you're starting out with a solid story, what do you put in place to make a small budget film successful? That's pretty simple. I think you have to have a script that is compelling, a page turner. It's got to be something unique, emotional. Secondly, you've got to have a director who knows what they're doing or if they don't and they're their script or they're funding it or whatever, then you better surround yourself with a director of photography who knows what he's doing, he or she, about how to compose the the visual image, an editor that knows what he or she is doing, and probably some kind of production person, a first AD, again, that knows what he or she is doing to put it together and help make that happen efficiently. Those three key positions, I think, are important. Then you got to have talent. So what kind of talent can you attract in front of the screen that's going to stand out and make a difference. It's not easy. There's five to 10,000 movies that get put up at Sundance every year. And that's one of a festival a week Mm -hmm. uh, around the world. So it's a very competitive, what makes you think you can stand out, you know, and you have to take chances to demonstrate that you can deliver the goods. Mm -hmm. So you better choose wisely in terms of the material and how you want to approach it and how you want to go about it. Mm. So if you don't have the budget, it's kind of one of those things where you have to distribute what little meager, meager budget that you have. into. Let me just say this. Let me interrupt you for just for a moment to say that it isn't always about budget Mm -hmm. because in 2009, the best picture that won the Oscar uh, was Avatar, you know, was a four, $500 million movie. A few years later, the movie that won the Oscar was in black and white. It was silent. Mm. It was made by a foreign company inside of Hollywood about the Hollywood history and didn't even have any help from California and the incentive to get it made. Mm. That won the Oscar, the artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, So, you know, if you tell a compelling story, you can be a little out of focus once in a while. You can have some bad edits. You can have some stuff that doesn't quite work uh, Mm. production-wise. But if the story's compelling, the audience will show up. Mm. The audience will watch. It isn't always about budget. Budget's not the compelling thing that makes an audience want to, you know, consume entertainment. Mm. Yeah. So on a practical level... When I'm, I'm going to put you in the the situation that um, like you had you had told a story, you were on Planet of the Apes, and you had to first pump water into a lagoon, 
<laughs> and then raise the temperature for the horses to to satisfy the the standards on set. So, right. all right. First of all, obviously, on a small budget film, you're not going to have horses necessarily. You're not going to have the resources you're not gonna be to a do that. Powell, right. Yeah, you're not going to be at that, all those places. But if a curveball comes at you real fast like that, which direction do you go? Do you do you go to the writers to like rewrite it in a way that doesn't include something? Hey, like we are on set today. This is a snag that we didn't see coming. Do we rewrite it out? Do we change the location? Do we try to negotiate? What's the first place you go to? Well, not to the script. Uh, you know, if we all believe in the story and we've we've been tracking that, we've built a plan to make that script work, then we're probably not running to the script first. We're trying to figure it out ourselves on the ground. What can we do? So in that situation, it was a studio movie. So the studio liked the script. They liked everything that was there. Tim Burton was the director. And so there were a lot of things in place that weren't about to change until we did our job. I think if we failed on five or six steps, um, mm-hmm. then we would have gone back to see, okay, does it have to be horses in the water? Could they be around the water? Could they, mm-hmm. you know, we, we, we'd figure out some other thing. But my responsibility, at least on that picture, was to figure out immediately how could we, you know, solve the problem. And mm-hmm. so on a bigger movie, I build an infrastructure that allows me to, to pivot. So the level of that lagoon was low because Lake Powell was beginning to lose uh, water there, which is now, you know, a very common story in California. That was the first problem. So I had my effects guys with a platform floating out there to pump water from Lake Powell into that lagoon. Mm -hmm. So that was the first problem we started a few days ahead when we realized when we got there that the water level was down three or four feet. And it was only after we were pumping water that we found out that the temperature was too cold for the horses in the ASPCA. Mm -hmm. So then we had to hook up a steam plant to heat the water going Mm -hmm. into the lagoon so that it would be good for the horses. No one cared about the actors or the stunt guys. No one cared about the horses. So, yeah, we just took sort of logical steps. How can we do this? When we've needed snow in a certain location by a date, I did the same thing. I put a plat on an X-Men. We put a platform out on a a lake, and we actually had a webcam and and a thermometer, and we could look at the webcam when we woke up to see, did it get down to 26 so they could turn on a blower and pump water through the blower and create snow on the location we wanted. Yeah. So, you know, you just try to find creative solutions along the way. That's a, those are bigger budget solutions. Mm-hmm. If you didn't have that budget, you'd, you'd find other solutions. You'd move to a location where you know you're going to have snow. You'd think in Canada you would, but we were stuck in Canada. Mm-hmm. So in doing the giver, I knew we would not have snow in South Africa. That would have been a nightmare. We wouldn't. Why create that situation? So we looked around the U.S. and said, where is it always going to have snow? And in Utah, actually near Park City and Sundance, how convenient, (laughs) the watershed for most of Salt Lake is up in uh, that, those mountains. So we found a suitable place up there to shoot where there's, we knew there would be snow in, um, in March and April and not be chasing it. Mm-hmm. So, so for a low budget film, though, you know, you say that you don't, you automatically don't go to the script to to fix it that way. I wouldn't um, know. Yeah. So, do you go towards like negotiating something with the, the, say, the keepers of the land, or would you just change a location altogether? You know, like that kind of thing. What if, like, I'm I'm just saying, nuts and bolts wise, do you which which part do you gravitate to? Yeah, I I think that you primarily would probably try to negotiate with the owner. So I made a small little movie about kids in a cemetery and we wanted to use the, uh, the incinerator, the crematorium that, that, so, you know, you got to build a relationship with those people and, Mm. well, we don't let people in there. It's, you know, private. Yeah. Okay. Well, how could we do this? And what could we do? And what would work for you? What time of day? What if we came after hours or, you know, there's, there's a myriad of solutions and it's trying to find a way that, you create value for the stakeholder that's the location owner and value for you that's helping to tell the story. And that negotiation, you've got to be clever and creative about that. So uh, mm-hmm. I, I don't think I'd run to the script first, not at all. I, I would try to find and exhaust as many uh, opportunities and variations and permutations that I could before I start changing the script. That's mm-hmm. if you've done your job properly, you've built a story that 
is efficient to begin with. If you don't have money, then you aren't having a battle sea on the water. So you're not going to be in that situation, right? Yeah. You're, yeah. you're going to talk about that battle and you're going to talk about how, how important that battle was and you're going to do it in a closet. Um, or you're going to be outside and refer to it just over the horizon, whatever, you know, there's lots of, <laughs> lots of creative ways to do that. But you're going to think that through in the script stage mm-hmm. and you're not going to put yourself in a situation where it's going to fall apart. Mm-hmm. How involved are you in the post-production and, you know, distribution side of things? Well, it depends on the project. So on some projects, I function like a line producer. And so I'm there in, the, in all the prep and the shooting and very little in post. If I'm producing the project, I'm involved in all stages of it all the way, you know, through putting it in theaters or getting it on the Netflix or working with the marketing and distribution. So mm-hmm. it depends on the role that you're hired to play and, and depends if it's something that I've developed or whether I'm a hired gun. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I mix those up. I'm, I'm a hired gun to pay the bills and uh, passionate about my own projects where I have to pay the bills. So with low budget films, I've heard a couple of different approaches for when it comes to distribution. They say like, oh yeah, you're going to package them together with other low budget films and like kind of present this whole entire package or I'm just going to go with just getting mine to it, which is there a better approach? No, it's, it's, again, it gets back to what your definition of success is and what you're trying to achieve. You're probably, you know, if you're trying to sell, yeah, if you're trying to sell it and you get packaged with someone else and you can't go on your own, then guess what? You're going to go with the package. So it depends on, again, it depends. You want to make it a business. Are you going to do this again and again and again, or is this your passionate project one time? I want to get this made. And if that's it, that's it. Mm -hmm. Then you might make different decisions, but if you're anxious to get this one seen so you can move on to the second one, you're probably going to take the path of least resistance, get it out there and, and mm-hmm. keep going. The long-term prognosis, the long-term is, is getting your work done, getting your movies made. Not all of them are going to be great, but you know, if you work a long time, I think you win in this business. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're not going to win making one movie. That's a mm-hmm. lottery ticket and that you have about the same chances of winning. You're only going to get better as a filmmaker when you make more of them. So if you're not shooting or developing something, even as a, a weekend shoot, why not? Why aren't you doing that? Why You can sleep anytime. You can go see mm. Hunger Games 14 anytime. You know, you should be spending your time advancing that, getting stuff made, getting it shown, getting it seen. Even if it's only in the mm. festival, you don't make money. Okay, on to the next one. What's the next one? Mm-hmm. Keep going. Keep yeah. making stuff. Keep failing but getting more experience about how to tell a compelling story. Mm -hmm. I think where the majority of our crowd is right now, our audience, they are the kind of first time directors where they really want to get something made and they are making either shorts or they're not interested in doing shorts anymore. They're like, no, I like, I want to, I want to make a feature and explore my talents in what that whole entire process looks like but there's always a huge shroud of mystery kind of surrounding distribution and, you know, that kind of stuff. And so, you know, not even knowing how to put together an attractive package for a distributor, like what does that even look like? You know, it's a compelling script. It's Mm -hmm. talent that they want to see on screen and that then the audience wants to see. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the short line to distribution is if you could make something in your closet and get millions of people to see it, that's all you need. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. But but it's kind of a problem unless you have a million people on your email list. You know, you got to figure out what is it that a distributor wants, build relationships with those people, which means you got to meet them. What, you know, how do I meet people? Well, how do you make friends? You got to go there. So yeah. if you're going to try to navigate the festival circuit without ever going to a festival, well, <laughs> how, how does that work? How yeah. are you going to do that? So the same thing's true of if you want to develop a relationship with a studio or at Netflix. Mm. or at, a, at a festivals, you got to go there. You got to meet people. You got to build relationships. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people say, well, you know, there's, it's all an insider business. Mm. Really? You, you don't think the, the, the hedge fund or investment banking or real estate is an insider business? It's who you know? Mm. Well, of course it is. Every business is that. So get out there. You're not going to succeed from your, from your bedroom. Yeah. You got to get out there and you got to meet people and do that. So mm-hmm. there's a wealth of information 
There's lots of stories of other filmmakers who have made it. Uh, mm -hmm. Read those stories. Who did they meet? How did they do it? Where did they go first? Mm -hmm. um, we want to make this $500,000 movie and the material we think actually works for Lifetime or works for Hallmark. Not sexy mm -hmm. uh, for a filmmaker, but hey, <laughs> if we can do a decent job and tell a story and get it out there and do it for a price uh, and license it for the amount of money that gets the money back for the investors, then great, we get to play again. Yeah. So, you know, everybody wants to go to Netflix. Okay, you know, enjoy yourself, have fun, go. Uh, yeah. Meet some people and see if you can figure out and crack the system. So when it comes to meeting these people, I had listened to this podcast about, you know, the guy who had actually gone to Sundance and was talking to distributors and with the changing market now, with the streaming services all having a content war right now, distributors are even a little lost. They're throwing everything against the walls, seeing what sticks and, you know, what will or won't happen. What are some of the changes in the industry that you're seeing coming up? I mean, this coronavirus might have been the catalyst for a lot of this change. Right. It might be, but, right. you know, it was the, the path was already kind of kind I of happening. Right. I agree. So how are you? I mean, right now there was a, there was an article that was talking about I think it was on Medium and talking about like the death and rebirth of Hollywood and how. Right how everything is going to be changing and the low budget films are really going to be coming into their heyday. How do you feel like those are going to affect um, those bigger industry films? And is this really a, a hidden opportunity for smaller filmmakers to come up? Well, sure. I, I think you're exactly right. I think this has only been a catalyst. I think things that were cracking and had fault lines and might've changed in five years have now changed in five weeks so mm -hmm. that everything's been accelerated. Uh, so that disparity between small and big is just getting, you know, that gap is getting bigger and faster. Yeah. So that opportunity for lower budget, you know, get a foot in the door is as good as it's ever been. Same principle applies. What's your compelling story? What's your angle? Well, how are you going to do this in a way that like the Blair Witch Project that no one else has done before? You know, coming up with that competitive, creative, compelling material is still going to be, you know, a winning strategy. What does the audience want to see? That, that's, that's why, it, except for Disney, that's so big right now, and that's probably an anomaly for a while. All the studios have about the same market share. Nobody knows the secret. Nobody knows. If they knew exactly what the audience wanted every time, they'd knock, everybody would be batting 1,000. They don't. Mm -hmm. They bat 250. They bat 300. They mm -hmm. fail seven or eight times out of 10. So, they're in the same position you are. You're smart. You may know and be able to speak to an audience that they don't, and they'd be interested in that. That's how I made the deal at Fox with a small budget Christian market trying to develop that. But mm -hmm. there'll be less and less that go to the theater. Theaters will be bigger movies. It'll take more money to get there. But streaming will just become more competitive. There's 26 streaming services that you can subscribe to in your home. 26. Mm -hmm. There's a wealth of stuff out there. What makes it stand out? I mean, that's why people make horror movies because they try to be the, the most uh, outrageous horror movie that can be made that gets attention. And then you got to go see this. I think at Paramount, when I was there, we had the first Halloween movie and it was rated X and we had to go in and watch the movie. It's a eight or eight or so of us executives that went in to cut it down to an R rated movie. You know, that movie was clever and creative and, to this day, I remember being in that room and the surprise at the end of that movie made every single person stand up out of their seat and go, oh my God. <laughs> so finding a creative way to make a compelling story that you think an audience wants to see is your angle to go out and talk to people and show it at festivals and demonstrate that you have the chops, that you have the ability to tell a story in a compelling way. That's what an audience wants. That's what they're going to tune into. That's what they're going to select on their Netflix screen, or they're going to figure out from their phone, or they're going to figure out in the most powerful way from their friends who say, oh man, you got to go see this. You got to watch this piece. You got to watch. Mm -hmm. This is the best thing I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. What changes have you seen in your immediate circle and platform, how these changes have affected that? Well, we're waiting to see how this, this, this happens. I was in Tokyo shooting until March 13th. 
Mm-hmm. And then we shut down on the 14th, came home from Japan on the 17th. And I think everyone's struggling with how do you make it safe? Uh, when is it safe to go back to work, et cetera? I think personally, it, it, it revolves around two or three things. I think number one, and I don't hear enough about this, and I, I may even write about this, it's about the actors. When are the actors going to feel safe without the visible mask protection mm-hmm. over them? Uh, and feel safe working 10, 12, 14 hour days. Who's the first person that's going to work next to Tom Hanks or Idris Elba and and know that they're safe? Mm. Is there long-term, you know, immunization from, we don't have any long-term survivors yet. Mm. We don't have reliable tests yet or quick yeah. testing, or we certainly don't have a vaccine. So I think that comfort level, unless you write a story with people with masks, oh, there's a creative idea. Hmm. <laughs> I wonder if anyone's doing that. Uh, so other than that, if you're going to tell a story, when are the actors going to feel comfortable? That's an issue for our, our small budget movie. You know, if the actors are comfortable, well, that's the first big step. And then I think the second step is how to keep the crew safe, but they can wear masks. We can do pods. We can wash mm-hmm. our hands. We can do what mom told us and, you know, get lots of rest and wash your hands and do all <laughs> that stuff. I think insurance will be an issue. They got to figure that out. If you sign a waiver and say, well, I won't hold you responsible if I come down with the virus. But is there still uh, an argument for duress? Uh, an argument for what? Duress. Sure. Yeah. yeah, sure there is. And then, you know, if, if you know, okay, I'm not going to hold you responsible. I come down with the virus. Well, now what do you do with the production? There's 30 other people that got exposed. Do you shut down the production? It's a really tricky, I don't think impossible to figure out, but it's tricky. And so the DGA, the IATC, SAG, lots of groups. I've read probably 10 different papers, 20 pages long. We need a medic every 15 crew members. Wash your hands every 30 minutes. Oi, you know, Mm-mm. this can be really more complex than it needs to. But It's going to be more money in the long run. And more, more money. I think it'll add 10% to everything. And this, you know, look, we don't board planes the way we used to. We won't make movies the way we used to. So- mm-hmm. All of that will shift and and uh, and adjust, but primarily, I think we got to figure out when when is Nicole Kidman going to feel comfortable, you know, in front of the camera. And frankly, a lot of the higher paid actors probably don't need to work. They don't feel a rush to come back and do this. Why would they endanger their families? Mm-hmm. So it's going to be an interesting transition to see who and and what happens in Tokyo. We had shot about a third of it. Michael Mann just wrote an an article today in Vulture about it and about, you know, when do we come back? Mm. And, you know, coming back is, is I think going to be about Ansel Elgort and Ken Watanabe. When are they going to feel comfortable? I don't know. How about yourself? I'm, I feel comfortable. I'm probably in that target zone because I'm old, but you know, I feel healthy and take care of myself. My wife's a school nurse. And so we, you know, we're, Sheltering is in place as much as possible. You go to the store when, only when you need to. Don't, mm. Cars don't get fired up once, two or three times a week, maybe at the most. Mm. But um, I didn't feel uncomfortable in Japan. Now, yeah. Japan is a mask wearing society. I felt <laughs> yeah. very good about all of that. And we were actually having dinner in very, you know, in Japan, restaurants are very, very small, tiny. I had dinner with Michael before I left and his wife and a couple of other camera operators. We were all crashed crushed into a, a 14 seat, you know, restaurant. <laughs> yeah. We all felt comfortable. We weren't wearing masks. We we're taking care of ourselves. Yeah. We we're coughing at anyone, <laughs> but we don't know enough yet about this virus. I don't want to diminish it. Mm. Uh, we just don't know uh, mm-hmm. enough about it and how it transmits and all that. And people are working hard and brave people are putting themselves on the line to help sick people. Yeah. So we, we need to figure this out. It'll be an odd transition, I think. It yeah. could, the transition could be 18 months. It could be a mm-hmm. long time. So for particularly crew that aren't necessarily being taken care of, I read maybe 100,000 people in Hollywood were out of jobs. Easy. So yeah. what are your words of advice or thoughts for those particular crew members to position themselves coming out of this or how to sustain themselves in the meantime? Yeah. First of all, I think a lot of the gig workers – crew members in Hollywood are used to working their tails off for six months and then being off for three or four months. So it's not, they learn to spend and save their money differently. So it's not that unusual. I think people that work in a factory and work 52 weeks a year are probably more at risk 
than people in Hollywood. Not to diminish that yeah. not earning an income isn't a good but thing. But being used to irregular income. Yeah, they're, they're used to an irregular up and down process. So it's not that unusual for us. It would be unusual if it goes on for six months or eight months. A lot of people have figured out how to adjust, uh, you know, over time anyway, in terms of, you know, other gig jobs they can do or, you know, so, so everyone tries to figure some of that out. Maybe if you're a hairdresser on set, you might give haircuts, although that may not be a sustaining job, uh, mm. you know, during a, a downtime. But everyone tries to figure that stuff out. Uh, and the hard part is if it goes on too long, people have to change and get out of the business and do something else. Yeah. So a lot of people moved to Atlanta to work there because there was a lot of production, not a lot of production there. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, that, that's a tricky question. I don't know. I don't know the answer to how to sustain yourself when you're a, a crew member and there's nothing else to do. Maybe if you're in special effects, there's other engineering or, or other work you can do in the meantime, but there's 30 plus million people out of work right now. So mm. uh, not a lot of jobs. Jobs that you think that you'd be relatively safe in, you know, yeah. I, you know, I know people who work at GE, I know who, you know, like specialized biking, you know, the, uh, the majority right. of their sales are in Europe and they're shut down. There's, that's yeah. not happening. So, I mean, I know that is, it is everybody. And I, I guess that's a little bit of a comforting aspect that it's not just great depression only in the United States. It's everywhere, yeah. you know, in a way that, you know, hopefully everyone will bounce back after this. You can yeah, have- I mean, getting on a plane to Europe wouldn't help you at the moment to find a job, nor <laughs> South America, nor any, anywhere else. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's the same all over. Everyone's trying to figure it out. You know, they're, they're doing some filming in Iceland. Baltazar Kormaker, I worked with him in, on a drift. He's got a project that's shooting there now. And they're trying to figure it out. There's been articles about that. Oh, so they're so, shooting right now? Like oh, yeah. presently? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, but there's there's little spots of that and they're figuring out. There's little examples of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we'll figure it out. It's hard to be patient. It's hard to sit still. It's hard not to get an income. And yeah, for people that want to break in right now, probably pretty tough. Pretty tough. There's a lot of... Um, people out of work and who knows how the festivals and how you're going to get to do that, you know, Mm. remotely, that's not going to promote relationships. It's hard to meet people over zoom (laughs) relationship that, uh, what are you talking about? We're meeting over zoom, (laughs) but, but, you know, in terms of doing business together and trying to, (laughs) yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. No, it's, it's rough. Um, I, I have heard uh, like a converse, theory that there's actually probably going to be a lot more opportunity after this because there's going to be such a cloud of confusion almost with a lot of the bigger entities. There's always been a shortage of a uh, capable crew, you know, so it's just kind of like, all right, well, maybe this is your time to, to go forth. Uh, there's going to be lots more streaming services that are going to be clamoring for content, um, smaller budget Films will have more of a chance, you know that kind of thing. You, it's possible. I mean, you know, yeah. again, those twenty six those twenty six streaming services are still at work right now, and they're figuring out a mm-hmm. when we go back to work. What are we going to do first? How do we get that crew back? There'll be a crush and a and a stiff competition to get a lot of production back up so that they can keep their inventory deep enough to mm-hmm. keep offering fresh things to an audience. And that level, it will be and. 20, those 26 streamers are actively trying to figure that out as well as what can they repurpose they have in their libraries. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think that'll happen. Whether that creates new opportunities beyond that, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it was busy out there before with 500 scripted television series going. That's a lot of stuff. And, yeah, yeah. there's not enough crew for all that around the world. Yeah, Not enough qualified crew, at least. You know, I I remember in your in your podcast that I had listened to that you found a lot of value in being a low level learner. Yeah, you know, look, you, you, I think you got to be in in my job. I think you have to kind of be a servant, kind of be being sure that you're helping others in the crew get to their desired goal. So that I want to I want to help the prop person, the prop guy realize his or her best work on the picture. And how can I help them do that? I'm not going to tell them what kind of pen they should use or what they should buy or how they, I don't care about that. All I care about is that they're going to do something the director likes and how can I help facilitate that? 
so that I can serve you, so I can help you get there. And to me, that frees up that person, motivates them, you know, satisfy the director, don't go over budget, and don't be late. If you can do all those three things, then knock yourself out. I don't care how you do it. You know, don't break the law. Don't, don't steal. Don't lie to me. But if you can do all those other things, then, ha- then have fun. And, and I like to develop that on a crew. And to me, how I treat a crew is, is very, very important. I want to make sure there's an environment that we all have a job to do and we do it well. And, um, you know, we promote people and fire people. So that happens. Um, but hopefully it's an environment where you can succeed. You can get the best out of what you do. Yeah. And I want to create that environment. And when there's something that goes wrong at home or somebody's sick, you know, go home, go be with your family. I don't want you. You're distracted. You're not useful to me when you're distracted. Mm. And if you're sick, I don't want you around because I don't want to get sick even before the virus. Mm. So yeah. you treat people fairly and, and, and compassionately and you build loyalty and you build trust. And then when it comes to the short strokes and I need people to stay a little longer or come in on, a, on another time, they're more than happy to come in and, and give a little extra because mm. I do the effort of trying to do that along the way. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. how you treat people in this business, I think also it's going to serve your long-term interests. So mm. you better be careful with the person that works for you today because you may be working for them tomorrow. That's happened to me a number of times in my career. Mm. So you got to treat everyone with respect. You, you diminish other people at, at, at a risk to yourself. Wow. Well, thank you so much for your time, for your insight and sharing your, your expertise. <laughs> I hope it's useful. You know, if there's anything useful, it could be a 10 minute podcast. That's fine. <laughs> We'll make sure it's longer because uh, it it definitely was a help. (laughs) Good, good. If you enjoyed this interview, follow us right here and check out more episodes at collabinc.org. If you have comments or know someone who would be a great guest on our show, send in your suggestions to tanya at collabinc.org. And again, we're really wanting feedback. So go to media.collabinc.org, fill out that feedback survey and you'll be entered to win a $25 Amazon gift card. Ralph, thanks so much again for your time. We'll see you next time on There to Hear.